we talk six months with Daisy, too many choices, and Apple's possible new Home OS. All this and more on this episode of Resi Week. This is Resi Week, episode 452, Sight, Sound, and Sensations. Welcome to this episode of Resi Week. This is your weekly roundup of all the latest news and stories for the residential AV industry. I'm your host, Matt D. Scott for avnation.tv. And this week, I'm pleased to be joined by two of my good friends. First, we have Mr. Richard Fergosa. He's the principal of Fergosa Design. How you doing, Rich? Good. Mellow West Coast, unseasonably warm greetings. Um, it's good to see it's been more in a minute. I know. It's, uh, been, it's been a while. Swing on by and spread my resi wings. So. Oh, there we go. I like it. Then we've got uh, my new friend, Chris Aram. He's the service manager at Eagle Sentry. How you doing, Chris? I'm well. How are you guys doing? We are doing fantastic. All right, gentlemen, we are going to kick this off with a couple of stories. The first one coming from Residential Systems, how a 25-year-old integration company transitioned to Daisy. Uh, if you don't remember, we've talked about Daisy a couple times in the last couple of weeks. They are a new uh, AV uh, home services company that has been not only uh, starting some new franchise locations, but also purchasing a couple existing companies to continue to grow uh, their company portfolio. And most, re or not most recently, but recently they bought uh, Gordon Van Zuden's um, as I'm blanking cyber manner. Thank you. Uh, out in California. And in this story, Gordon goes through what the last six months have been like since the acquisition of Daisy um, or by Daisy of his, his company that he launched, you know, 20, 30 years ago, go read through the story. It's a very interesting read and shows, you know, kind of that, that big transition from initial owner and founder into uh, somebody that's working with a transition team on an acquisition like this, which again, this is normal in big business. This is not as normal in our industry. Rich, I want to start with you on this one. Is this what we kind of are going to expect to see continue and grow in our industry as, you know, the story alludes to and, you know, conversations with uh, the CEO of Cedia alludes to the channels looking for more national exposure, more, you know, consumer awareness. And one of the ways in, in theory to get that is by having these big brands that are recognizable. Is, is that something that is going to, you know, increase in the future? Or is that something that may or may not be, you know, that golden goose for awareness in our channel? Depends on how long the investors decide to stick around. Um, you're seeing, you know, you're seeing it on the manufacturer side and, and you're seeing it now on the dealer side as the, the market's matured um, and the industry is matured and that you're seeing consolidation. It's no different than in any other industry that we've seen before. As we saw it in security, I know that Chris, you know, is involved in the security business. This started with, you know, it's the same analogy. You had mom and pop security shops that had, um, you know, their service contracts. And then at one point it caught interest of deeper pockets and deeper pockets went, well, gee, if we could find a way to manage all of this and aggregate it, there's something to be done there. Mm -hmm. And they went out and they found the smaller operations. And then what happened is it got to a point in certain industries that is very difficult to be a mom and pop operation because yeah. you are now facing something much larger. So the consolidation in this industry is something that's already happening just because of the nature of the way the technology is shifting. You not only have your competitors like Daisy, you have your competitors like Apple, like Google, like Amazon, who are finding ways to um, Walmart now on your TV, right? Um, they're finding ways to provide common goods, and treating electronics as common goods is almost white goods at this point. And so if your model is still, and it, you know, and it, it, it's, it's one of those things that kind of hurts my heart a little bit, but if your model was that you were a passion, you were a hobbyist or you're passionate about AV and, and you decided that you're super really into home theaters and all of these things, that, that's great to find a way to get into the industry. But to sustain it in the industry with the market that's changing, you've got two choices. You have to really, really separate yourself 
or you have to go along to get along because that middle market of, you know, and again, I feel like I'm kind of, you know, back in my day again, you know, this is, this is not the CDA channel of, of 25 years ago. Um, the margins are different. The client expectations are different. The clients are different. Um, just in general and the expectations and the immediacy and instant gratification and all of the things that are going on. And, and oddly enough, the current client base that we see a lot of is willing to forgive tech from a large company, but mm -hmm. is not willing to extend that level of forgiveness to a personalized company or a smaller company, right? If, if there isn't, uh, you know, a, a, a ecosystem-wide blackout from a major manufacturer. Everybody groans and gripes and everything else, but they don't leave. They don't go to another competitor or say, we're gonna go to, to Y. They just kind of grin and bear it and they've accepted it. With smaller companies, you've got different expectations that are going on. So, you know, part of the consolidation and, and where it's going, I think that there'll always be a need and there'll always be a market for smaller companies. Um, but the smaller companies and the service they provide and the personal attention and everything else, um, you've got to find out what your 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 secret sauce is going to be. Because if you're just going to try to compete on, well, we sell X as well, that's not going to give you um, sustainability yeah. over time. And, you know, this is this is just uh, this is just another evolution in how the market is going. And. The hardest part is letting go of the way that you did business or what got you into the business and now focusing on what's going to keep you in business. And the article is fantastic mm -hmm. because, you know, we've heard about these other groups that have come together, right? They form like these super bands of AV yeah. companies, but they're walled gardens. They went, hey, we're all together. And yes, we looked at everybody's business profiles and we did a deep dive on their financials and now they're part of us. But they didn't explain how or why or mm -hmm. what, you know, the actual process is. What I appreciate appreciate about Daisy's approach is their transparency. Yeah. And they're pretty forthright about saying, here's who we are. Here's what we're looking for. And this article was great because for a company who is looking for either a succession plan or a sale plan down the road, sometimes the first question is, how do I do it? Yeah. <laughs> and so, or what's it going to look like? And this is great. It, it's, it's worth the read. If for no other reason that if you ever thought one day when you started your company, who would buy it? <laughs> yeah. How would they buy it? Right. And this article is kind of a primer on, well, here are the things that a company did and why they were attractive to an outside investor for an acquisition. And then that allows you as a business owner to take a look and say, oh, that's not really going to work for me or my personality or my business model. What I appreciate out of this too is it's written by Gordon from his perspective. It's not written by someone in Daisy, which, you know, again, I'd love to see that perspective as well, but how Daisy views an acquisition honestly doesn't matter a lot to me as someone who owns an integration firm. How Gordon went through the process and how he's feeling going through the process is much more intriguing to me. All right, Chris, let me, let me come over to you for a second. What I find somewhat I don't want to say comical, but I'll say comical just because it's the best uh, word here. What I find slightly comical about this is we continually talk about the home technology industry as if it is an entity uh, un uh, of itself, right? No other home service company or, or industry works the way ours does. But this is not unique to us alone. There are a ton of other uh, home service companies and industries that are dealing with this with national identity issues and trying to create national brands, right? Um, what what Rich alluded to with, with you and Global Century coming at it from the security side, I think the security acquisitions have almost been easier because those business models are quite uh, consistent and, and, and standardized almost, even though they're all individual companies. Is that going to be the biggest hindrance to developing a couple of national chains, if you will, uh, for the home technology side of things? 
I think the biggest hindrance is going to be that the different levels of the smart home experience. And let me explain further. I think a lot of people get into smart home by getting their first sort of smart home devices. They're not going full in on the smart home. They're getting something like a smart doorbell or a smart thermostat. And then you start to evolve. Um, there's franchises like uh, Vivint who does the very sort of basic DIY smart home stuff, but they do it for you. That's what I would call maybe the first sort of integrator um, a model of what Daisy's trying to be like. I think Daisy even takes it a next step further where they're not just serving the basic customer, they're serving the middle end to high end customer. But I think with their acquisition strategy, they're going to have to be very careful um, how they navigate the super, super high end and working with the, you know, the middle end customer and how they can both speak to both of them with the same sort of messaging um, but also have it be effective for both of them. I think that's going to be the biggest challenge overall for Daisy is just really finding out who is their market. Because if you're in 20 different cities around America, each customer is going to be vastly different. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're all chiming in from different parts of the world that we can agree that the customer in you know, the Midwest, you know, a city of less than 50,000 people or less than 100,000 people is going to be different than the New York City, the Hamptons, where the expectation is very different. But I think there's a lot of positive also from the um, the bringing together of these organizations. I think in the article, they say that they're going to have extremely qualified um, technicians available for remote support. And I think that is something that, you know, every integrator around the company around the country will benefit from. Do you guys think that the customer identification issue is going to be the biggest by far the biggest issue of any national type organization? Um, I Maybe not identifying it, but truly streamlining what needs to be done and, and finding out how to best serve the customer, I think, and, and bring them on the experience that they were looking for. Don't cut them short if they were looking for a truly high-end experience. And if they were, you know, looking for a mid-level experience, don't sell them a, something they can't afford type of thing. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, gentlemen, let's change topics for a second. This also comes to us from a residential systems and a good friend of the show, Mr. Henry Clifford. Killing me softly by my favorite Fuji's uh, song by far uh, with too many choices. Henry got an email uh, a couple of weeks ago from Ford talking about their new F-150 Lightning pickup truck. He got all excited, went, hmm, I'm in a buying mood. I'll go take a look. He then proceeded to get uh, kind of sent down a rabbit hole of a variety of choices and uh, things that he had to do before he even got to the point of being able to you know, try and build his personalized truck for him at which point he then again got completely overwhelmed by the ridiculous number of features that he had to specify uh, as he was looking at this and asked the question of simple is really, really hard. And it's the hardest thing that we deliver to our customers. How do we as integrators deal with this? Chris, let me, let me start with you on this one. Um, I love this article because so often we think that, you know, buying something is really, really simple. And sometimes it is. Uh, when we bought my wife's van, there were all of three choices. We could pick a level, like a package level from Honda. We could pick a color. And that was literally it. There were no options you could add on to anything. It comes how it comes. If you want leather, that's up here. That was $5,500 to go up to the next package that had a bunch of other crap we didn't want. Um, but you got leather. It was not a la carte by far uh, in, in this F-150. It seems that it is. In our industry, one of the things that I think is is a continual challenge for, for integrators is we continually have to walk that tightrope of offering too many, too many options or not enough and not really understanding where in you know, our vast product offerings that client really resides. How do you go about trying to determine what you're going to actually offer when, again, you know, we have a, a ridiculously wide swath of, of solutions? Yeah, so I fall more into the simple camp. I think consumers get definitely 
uh, overloaded by decision making. So I think it's best to go good, better, best. I think that can fit a lot of people's categories. I think when you introduce something like every option available, it can become overwhelming very quickly. Um, however, I do have a case study of someone who is doing, you know, so let's say you go to a home theater demo and you're deciding on which speakers you want to buy for your home theater. Um, I was chatting with the guys at Audio Advice and they make some YouTube content um, and they're an integrator out of North Carolina. They put their clients through like a four hour seating um, to have them test out like 20 different brands of speakers so they can find out really what matches to them. And I think that's one way to do it. But I also find from a business perspective, when you're carrying 20 different products, you can't really master all 20 of them. So you're now providing a mediocre experience, if you want to call it that. But I think if you have mastery of three products, a good, better, best, I think it might not be custom integration. It may be more sort of cookie cutter integration, mm -hmm. but I think custom integration doesn't serve most people best. I don't think it serves the customers best, nor do I think it serves the integration firms best either. Yeah, that's a good point. Rich, I, I, this is something that I'm continually baffled with. And you and I have talked about this multiple times. Chris's point of having a good, better, best is, is fantastic. And almost all of us use it. But it, even that can have a massive range. If you have a customer who's going to buy a car, like in this case, um, Henry was, he wanted an electric pickup. There's three choices, four choices on the market right now where he can go. And they have different price points, but there's only four. And if he's looking at this versus looking at a Rivian, he's going to know without even building it kind of what that price point is. If you have a customer who just wants a car, they could look at a Civic or a Kia they could also look at a Maybach or a Ferrari or something even crazier. And if they don't have any frame of reference, the price difference could be good, better, best, and go from, you know, 15,000 to 50,000 to 250,000. In AV, customers usually have no idea what they want or where they want to be or even what they want to spend based on the performance they actually want to achieve. Is there a way to expand our customers, you know, market awareness, if you will, of what's available to them without overwhelming them and instantly just going to the, well, what do you want to spend? The beauty of this industry comes down to the visceral. Okay. It is sight, sound, sensation. Where a lot of integrators get lost is, and again, it's, we're all, we all fall prey to this. They're gearheads. And, you know, I, I always laugh. I started out in art school. And so my medium has always been, where's the emotion? Um, going on 30 something years doing this. When I'm the most successful is when I'm focused on what is the emotion that they're looking for. Because there's going to be a very different way of approaching your market. And this goes back to being, and I've, I've said it so many times, right? Know your lane. Know how to play within yourself. I've hit so many trade shows over the years that I, and I, we always joke about this, where I'll meet young integrators and, or when the market's really high and it's like, how you doing? Oh, we're great. We don't touch anything for less than seven figures. And we've got more projects than we've ever seen. And I'm like, I'm doing the math in the industry. It ain't happening. I know it's a great idea and I know it's a great goal. But come on. So the first part is know your company, know yourself, know your skill set. A lot of times where the mistake comes from is that, uh, you know, what is it? Champagne, uh, what is it? Uh, champagne wishes, caviar dreams, but a beer budget. You know, if your skill set, you aren't ready yet to deliver the caviar experience, it's okay. It's, it's setting your ego aside in the moment and looking at your business as an entity first and saying, and, you know, Chris brought a great point. I've got 50,000 people in this town. <laughs> I know that the median income is X. There is no way that I'm coming in with a $640,000 Meridian system. You know, maybe, maybe one in there, but that's just not gonna happen. 
So first is always applying your market, your business, and your abilities. Now, you can always swing for the fences. You can always punch out your weight class, right? You know, we all, we, you don't get your first big one until you get your first big one, right? So you're always reaching and pushing. But we always call them the bread and the, 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 the utilities projects, right? I liked when I was, when I was an integrator, for me, it was like, which one of these is going to go ahead and pay the, this week's rent for the office? Which one's paying for the cell phone bills? Which one are the ones that are taking care of this, right? Here are the base, the bread and butter, the foundation of everything that I need for my business to exist the next month. Then I go, all right, now that I'm there and I know that I've got my sweet spot here that I can sell X and I can come in and provide a sound bar, a display, maybe some simple voice control, you know, maybe some basic networking, right? And you drop it in and you go, okay, now, now I'm swinging for the fences. Now that I've got something with the client and they go, but is there more, right? Integration is what we do is change in terms of the technology and the cost. I kid you not that stuff that any integrator can get from a distribution standpoint, they can put in a current client's residence for a $2,500 was a $300,000 custom solution for me 30 years ago. And it was a one-off <laughs> and we built it from scratch, right? So the market, and that's great that the market is exposed, that there's bigger outreach, but you can't have the stories of yesteryear guide you into how you're going to go ahead and, and try to make the sales today. So, you know, a, a big part of it really is becoming a matter of, you know, know your business, know your model. Good, better, best is always great, right? Simple solutions, right? You know, you never go for yes, no questions. Always work your way through. You know, it's for us and it's always been like what well, what we've explained and how we've kind of evolved is that I don't even talk about simple. I'm like, I'm not worried about simple. Do you want it to be elegant? You've got high end faucets here. You've got a steam bath here. That's a forty thousand dollar rug. Are you looking for elegance? Are you looking for something that is that is going to be just kind of a good enough and good enough is okay, right? Because they may not be in that point where they could justify spending $30,000 on a granite countertop. Won't even think about it because that means something to them. But if it's just, oh, it's just TV and three of my kids just watch it on their phones anyway. Well, that's an uphill battle at that point. So then you come back and you go, okay, great. I'll meet you where you're at. And then you lay, lay the foundation for them to be grow to to grow into the system. The whole point is once you get that customer, the easiest customer, <laughs> the easiest customer to sell to is the one you got, you know. And I think that's where integrators sometimes forget is that they go for that home run shot, hit some singles, yeah, <laughs> just hit some singles, work your way through. Um, and at that point, I think in this market, if you're going to be a small independent integrator, you know those are the keys to sustainability. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, let's hit our last topic quickly before we close. This comes to us from CE Pro. <clears throat> Apple could release new smart home displays and an OS next year. Uh, this comes from, uh, again, he's referencing a Bloomberg article uh, where they're working on a tabletop device that will have a uh, robotic arm with a iPad-like display running potentially a new home OS, as well as some additional home products. Richie, let me let me start with you on this real quickly. We have been, we've been following Apple in the home for years. We've continually talked about at some point they will get serious with this and they'll actually put some development into it. Um, is this them actually starting to play with it? HomePod came out, it was lackluster to be polite. Um, home uh, Apple TV with their home app, again, mediocre, didn't really do much. There are enthusiasts that love it and I understand that. Um, but in our world, they're, they're still not there. With them potentially dedicating uh, a, a dedicated screen device, running a dedicated OS, 
is that showing a bigger commitment from Apple to get into this space? I'm going to seed my minutes here because ironically enough, Chris, I know has a lot of a deep understanding and appreciation for HomeKit and everything else. So although I have my ideas about it and my opinions of it, it just so happens that <laughs> this is perfect to tee Chris up and find out where he's going. Because I have a feeling he's got a, an idea of the pulse on how consumers um, would open up to it. Richie, I, I, I appreciate it. So um, you hit the nail on the head. My entire smart home is based on the Apple HomeKit platform. Um, so there, there definitely is some flaws with the HomeKit ecosystem. However, Apple has definitely been opening up their walled garden. They're allowing more and more manufacturers to um, work with their HomeKit um, ecosystem. They got really everything you need, climate control, AV systems, shades, um, really like it, it goes on and on, networking, internet uh, cameras, things like that. But to answer your question very directly, is this the one thing that they've been missing to take it to the next level? Like, no, this is probably not going to be the next, uh, the thing to take it to the next level. I think it is going to be an evolution on the HomePod. I think it is going to be um, a device that is in a lot of people's homes, whether that's their bedroom or their kitchen. I think Apple Home really shines for people who already use iPhones, who are already using iCloud, things like that. And I've seen tremendous investment done by Apple, not only in time, improving the home application, but they're, they're putting in the resources to truly bring Apple home to the masses. And I think the masses, there's always going to be their place for custom integration. Um, but I think more and more people are going to take advantage of something like Apple Home rather than even like a basic Control 4 setup. I think that Apple Home is about as powerful as it needs to be for, you know, the 80% of the users. It's not going to do the the top 20% of things, but I think for most people, your your colleagues, your family, your friends, I think they'll all be very happy with something like an Apple Home smart home. Do you think that the expectation of Apple to do something phenomenal is something that actually holds Apple back? because people expect it because I, as much as I teed it the way I did, I agree with Chris. I think HomeKit works really well for a lot of users. I have a bunch of customers that use it. It's their only platform and they're perfectly happy with it. The same way I have a bunch of customers that use smart things. They love it. It does what they need it to do and they don't expect it to do more. But I think Apple kind of gets handcuffed sometimes because it's Apple. People expect the world from Apple. And even when they deliver something that is competent and functional, it's not, it, it may not be groundbreaking in the way that people expect it to be. I don't think it does because I think, you know, if we just saw Control 4's latest um, video release from Cedia, they basically took the entire user interface of Apple Home. And say, same with Crestron Home. Guys, so... Apple is is leading the way. I don't I don't think that they I think that they have to make a quality product and I think that they have delivered on that. I don't think that they're currently not producing more because they're locked into some sort of quality. I don't think they're trying to compete with Crestron or anything like that. I think they're they're truly just trying to provide a safe user experience for you know, aspects of their home. And I think that they're doing that well. And I think that they're going to continue to do that well. And it's going to become a, like, I think Apple home services is going to become a larger part of their market share. I think it's, it's going to evolve from just computers and iPhones. And I think it is going to see, you're going to see more in the home sector already with Apple TV speakers like that. I don't know if they'll ever manufacture their own lighting systems or things like that. I doubt it, but I think that they could partner with someone and, and be, even more successful, a Crestron Apple partnership would be, you know, the greatest partnership of all time in terms of our industry. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, gentlemen, let's wrap it up there. Thank you both so much for joining us. Chris, if people want to connect with you, uh, follow your show online, where can they do that? Yeah, so they can find me on YouTube, Chris Orm Smart Home or Chris double underscore Orm on all social media platforms. Looking forward to connecting. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uncle Richie, if people want to connect with you, find out more about Fergosa Design, where can they do that? 
Well, you can type my name into the interwebs. Uh, eventually something will pop up. You can find us on the website, fregosadesign.com, uh, on the socials at rfregosa. But as I say, first and foremost, I hope that you find uh, me here on avnation.tv and all of our shows that uh, uh, cater to all of the different verticals that are out there, including one about the control systems industry that I host with my that that, that I co-host with my good friend Steve Greenblatt, the state of control. So maybe you'll find me there or any of our other shows. And first and foremost, I hope that you will support our sponsors along the way. Excellent. Thank you again uh, for joining us. If you'd like to connect with me, you can find me on Twitter or X at Matt D. Scott and most other social platforms. But more importantly, please visit aviation.tv where you'll find this show as well as a wide variety of other shows with all the verticals that we cover. When you visit the website, please take a moment to check out our supporters. We are extremely thankful for the support and ask that you check them out as well. Thanks again for watching. That's all the time we have for this episode of Resi Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. This is AV Nation.